Good evening. Thank you, everybody, very much for joining us tonight. Um, for those that don't know, my name is Jennifer Burgess, and I'm the Communications and Customer Engagement Manager at AIS. So my team and I are responsible for ensuring that you know all that's going on at AIS. In particular, we write and deliver and produce many of those emails that are currently flooding your inboxes as we work through our current situation. Um, we also are responsible for events at AIS and um, we are deliriously excited to be able to launch this brand new series called AIS Talks. Um, uh, said we have wanted to do this for a while so our, our current situation has actually played quite well into that. Um, so one of the values of AIS is lifelong learning and um, that's something that we've, we've really invested in for our students but we also think is really important for everybody in our community and I'm pleased to see a lot of our academic staff uh, and support staff here as well. So we're hoping that through this series we'll by the speakers that we introduce you to, that we'll be able to fit not only inform, but also help to inspire you, because we're looking to do something that takes us beyond education. So that's our aim here tonight. Um, before I go on and introduce Alice a, a little more, in a little more detail, I'd just like to go through a couple little housekeeping things. And you'll have to forgive us, because as I said, this is our first, our first event, so we're, we're hoping that there won't be too many technical problems. Um, one of our aims is that you'll all ask questions of Alice. So um, we have actually got everybody's microphones muted at the moment. Um, Alice will present, and at the end, there will be an opportunity to uh, ask her questions. If you would like to ask questions during the presentation, um, please feel free to do so via the chat box. I'm sure everyone's very Zoom savvy these days. So there's a chat and send your questions either through down to everyone, I think it's everyone, or um, the Australian International School if you'd rather keep your question private. And we will, we will ask Alice's questions at the end. Or if you want to, you can ask her yourself just by unmuting your microphone at the very end. Right, so it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Alice Clark Platts. Alice is an author, a former human rights lawyer, whose crime novel, The Taken, was shortlisted in, which is a fascinating title to me, the Dead Good um, Reader Awards of 2017 for Best Police Procedures. So I think we're all a little curious at how she researched <laughs> that book to attain that award. She's also, most famously in Singapore, the founder of Singapore's Writers Group, um, which now has over a thousand members. She teaches creative and non-fiction writing at LaSalle College of the Arts. She has taught law at the National University of Singapore. And I'm sure you're all as excited as I am to learn more about her journey from lawyer to writer, and in particular at the moment, to hear about her thoughts on all things COVID-19. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Alice clark Platt. Thanks, Alice. Thank you, thank you, Jen. Um, hello, it, this, is, this is quite odd. I was saying to Jen that I was imagining everybody in a big hall somewhere, but of course you're all in your houses and I can't really get my head around it, but it's very nice to sort of not see you. Um, and it's, it's really lovely to be here and to be invited by AIS um, and what I'm sure is going to be an amazing series of talks. So thank you for having me and thank you for inviting me. Um, and as Jen said, I was, I was invited to come and talk to you about my career, my, my sort of transition from being a lawyer and then into being a writer, but also to talk about resilience and adaptation. And when um, I heard that, I thought, okay but i'm not a professor of organizational behavior i'm not a psychologist i'm not a professor of sociology i have got a master's degree but it's in law um so i'm not an academic so what do i know about these two qualities resilience and adaptation so i started thinking about them and then i thought well actually i probably do know a little bit about them and i'm just going to show you a few kind of examples of how perhaps i do so this is me I hope you can all see that. That is me in 2011. Um, as you can see, not that, I was incredibly pregnant <laughs> um, with my 
second, my youngest daughter, um, I was about seven months pregnant, eight months pregnant there. And we'd moved to Singapore two months before, one month before. But we, I was very pregnant when we arrived with our two-year-old, Connie. Um, I think that's on Bintan, actually. We went away for a weekend. And um, before that, I'd been a lawyer. I'd met my husband. We were both trainee lawyers. And uh, I went into human rights litigation. He went into corporate law. He had an opportunity to have a secondment in Singapore just as I got pregnant for the second time. And I thought, yeah, great. I'll go and spend my maternity leave sitting on a sun lounger in the sunshine, you know, to escape the, the British winter and then um, come and have a, have a great time in Singapore. And so we were supposed to come here for 18 months. Um, and so while I was here, I then had India. <laughs> there she is. Um, and but I also because I had of course marvelous domestic help I, I was able to start writing this novel that I'd been thinking about um, for a long time I mean I had a father who was a writer so perhaps it was in my genes somewhere but I you know I wasn't working and so I had some time to write um, I actually the first novel that I wrote which has never been published um, was, a, was a book called War Child and the premise of it was, or premise of it was that um, it was a kind of dystopian thriller where all the countries in the world close their borders and a woman gets on the run with her baby and she, she can't get out of the UK and everything. And nobody wanted to publish it because they said, you know, that's ridiculous. I mean, countries will never close their borders, you know, <laughs> what a stupid idea. So gutted that I didn't publish that in 2012 because I would have been raking it in now. Um, but so I'd, I'd written that and then I started writing a crime thriller it's just because I love crime thrillers that's kind of what I like to read so I thought I'd challenge myself to write one and then I also as Jen mentioned set up the Singapore Writers Group um, again not really sure why I did this a lot of the things that have happened have been quite sort of fatalistic like they did sort of happened like kismet or something there was actually already a Singapore Writers Group in existence that I just didn't notice or didn't find out about so I set this up um, on meetup and gradually we kind of overtook the other group and we're now um, we've been now been going for eight years and uh, we have a huge amount of members we've got some really talented people who've been published um, and it was also great to have a community of writers um, that you know to, to share our stories and share our writing journeys so you know time ticked on and oh look it's 2014 and we've been still in Singapore so our 18 months have now extended considerably um, but here we were and in 2014 with the Singapore Writers Group right, what we did as a group was we published this we self-published it um, Rojak stories short, an anthology of short stories so we put it on Amazon there's a photo of me there which is when we went to the other Writers and Readers Festival in, in 2014 and we launched our book there and it was you know it was really exciting it was just like great fun and everybody was really pleased um and so then i think i started to, to get a bit more serious about my writing and um you know i had this manuscript war child um and then i had this crime thriller book that i was working on and so i was sending war child out to agents and of course there's these things called the slush pile which is i'm the agent in my marvellous office and behind me is this huge pile of manuscripts that people are sending me every day that I never bother read. I receive them, I just throw them behind me, I just can't bother to read them. So I was getting rejection after rejection after rejection. So I started doing an online course with the crime novel that I was writing and as it turns out I did manage to get an agent. And so then things started to change and she decided to concentrate on the crime thriller which I'd now finished and she started sending it out to publishers so you go through one stage you've got the agent hurdle overcome now you've got to get it published so then you know you've got all these books going out to all these publishers and it, you know again a lot of rejection a lot a lot a lot of rejection um and out of I think she you know she's been I don't know one said yes to my crime thriller and I mean, incredibly for me that one was penguin and so I was made up you know a massive fan of Agatha Christie and just loved one of the penguin books it's just so iconic and so there I was so bitter fruits was my first book with them the taken 
as Jen mentioned, um, the second in a, in a series, this was a police series set in Durham, where I went to university. And we're still in Singapore, obviously, you know, the 18 months now, Tom's doing well in his job, the girls are happy at their various schools, they're kind of growing up, we're enjoying the life, there doesn't seem to be a massive need to, to go back to London. Um, around 2016, I think, was when Brexit happened, so it was another reason to, to stay out here. And, um, you know, so I was thinking, okay, well, I'll, I'll do this, I'll be this professional writer. And then my editor at Penguin left. The new editor that replaced him didn't take me on for another contract. So that was quite um, just discombobulating because I, you know, then I, I didn't have sort of authenticity, as it were, because I didn't have a contract. I did still have my agent, and she said, you know, you just got to write another book and then we'll try and sell it. So I had to write a book out of contract. And I'd always had this idea floating around my head about this murder of, of Jamie Bulger, which happened in the UK um, many years ago in the 1990s. And I wanted to write something kind of loosely based on that about children and their sort of motives for crime. And so that became The Flower Girl. And my agent was helping me with the, the whole process of writing the novel and she was helping me with the editing. She kept on sending back all these edits. I mean, it was just going back and forth and back and forth. And I was getting incredibly frustrated. This was at the end of 2017. That she was never going to send it out. You know, that she was never going to be happy enough. It was never going to be good enough for her to, to send out to publishers. And so then she said, you know, December, I think, 2017, she said, I'm going to send it out now. I think it's ready. And I said, don't do it. Like, leave it until 2018, January. I just feel like this year's been rubbish. Haven't it? You know, it's just been really stressful. Just let's just, like, you know, keep our powder dry, send it out in the year, fresh start, whatever. Um, and she said, well, I, I hate to tell you, but I have actually already sent it out to 10 publishers. And I, I was like, oh my God, so what have they said? What have they said? Great news. Pretty much all of them wanted it. And so then we got into this auction situation, which was amazing. And then 2018, 2019, when it was published, then The Flower Girls was, was incredible. It was very exciting. I was, you know, I'd gone from kind of thinking I didn't have a contract to then suddenly having this great contract. And Bloomsbury, who published it, Bloomsbury Raven, were incredibly supportive and they just, you know, they, they, you know, they put on a great launch in London, you can see there's my mum, very proud. And there's India, um, we had a launch here in Singapore, it's been a career and, you know, there's the baby India who's now, I think she was seven or something then. Um, so yeah, and then it, you know, it sold, it sold to Norway and France and, you know, I mean, lots of places, it was just really, really exciting. And I was thinking, great, so now I'm like, I'm, I'm concerned. I am definitely a writer. I mean, that, that's what I do. This is, this is my job now. And I, as, as Jen says, again, you know, like I've got a job teaching at La Salle. In fact, I'm teaching a course coming up soon, an online course. Um, if, uh, if anyone wants to come, sorry, I just had a message come up on my screen. Um, so great, life with life is good. 2019, brilliant. You know, everyone's happy. And then that happened. <laughs> and 2020 started. And it became the year that nothing happened. The year of doing nothing. And this is where we come into the resilience and adaptation part of my talk. And I'm very happy to take questions on writing and, and all of that process as well at the end. But in terms of talking about the topics that um, Jen and Michelle have asked me to talk about, I think that now obviously is a time where everything that we took for granted is gone. So the future is uncertain, whether it's how we educate our children, how we interact, whether we can still earn a living, whether anything will survive from the economy to our loved ones it's frankly massively depressing but resilience and adaptation and looking back on my life how can I say that I haven't adapted from child to lawyer to wife to mother to expat to author 
But if I sat down and told you that each and every one of those changes, those adaptations, had shaken me to my core, had rocked every foundation I had, had unutterably changed me, whether for good or bad, you'd probably think I was a bit of a loser, a bit weak, someone who can't handle her stuff. But the truth is, that even though what I've said is the truth, I took it all in my stride. I dealt with it like we do. Moving out of home, getting married, giving birth, moving to the other side of the world, all of these are pretty seismic events in a person's life. There's a reason why these are the photos that play in the montage at an 80th birthday party or at a funeral. But even though they're life-changing, we just get on with it. We look around and we see that everyone else is getting on with it. Billions of people have given birth, got married, got divorced, experienced grief, and they're all still standing, still laughing, living their best lives. So even though these events change everything about us sometimes, we accept them as a normal part of life. So I was thinking this, and I was thinking, well, that means, doesn't it, that just human beings are just essentially resilient. If we go through all this stuff, and yes, sometimes we need therapy, sometimes we fail, we behave badly sometimes, but on the whole, we do our best. We don't give up, we don't bow out, we just get on with it. But why is that, I thought? Why are we so resilient that we are so adaptable? I reckon the question that's asked the most in social situations, oh, I'm getting something about my mic. Uh, is everyone else finding it hard to hear? I think it might be just bouncing against your necklace, Alice. I take my necklace off. Maybe that would be, yeah, even as pretty as it is. Thanks. That okay. Be... Oh, thank you. <laughs> I take off, I <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a school, so if you could just leave it at that, that would be great. <laughs> okay. So, social situations. Um, the question I think that is most asked in a social situation, apart from how are you, is so what do you do? And our answer to that, at least my answer to it, is dependent on lots of different factors. Um, who I'm talking to, how I'm feeling, who I'm with, and often how grumpy I'm being, because I often think, what does it matter what I do? Wouldn't you rather know who I am? But the reality is that people we meet in life are often more interested in what we do than who we are. And maybe I'm being a little unfair because it's awkward, isn't it? How do you ask who someone is? It's kind of socially impossible. So people stick to the easy route, at least at first. What do you do? Oh, okay, you're a lawyer, a banker, a mother, a writer, a housewife, a psychoanalyst, a website designer. And we make assumptions instinctively and with good reason based on the answers we hear. What people do gives us a guide, something to hang the beginning of a friendship on. What do you do? And when you think about it, even in terms of stress and even in times of stress or worry, that's the question we focus on. What are you going to do? So when I was thinking about this, it occurred to me that I got it wrong, that who we are and what we do aren't so distinct. It might be nice to think of ourselves individually as incredibly special or unique, but look at the things we all need, which leads to the things we all have to do. We all have to eat, we all need shelter of some kind, we need money to buy those things. Most of us on the whole need connections to help us thrive, social and loving connections. And we all share the knowledge that one day we are all going to die without exception. A few years ago, a good friend of mine was um, killed on the road here in Singapore, out riding his bike very early one morning. He was hit by a truck and um, pretty much died instantaneously. He just got engaged. He was 30 years old. His fiance was woken up that morning by a telephone call that all of us would be appalled to receive. That morning, her life completely changed. All her plans were wrecked. Everything she thought was about to happen in her life suddenly wasn't. What did we as her friends do? We took her food. We drank wine with her. We talked. We hugged. We remembered. And I think that's why this COVID-19 period of time is so particularly hard. All of the things that we normally do when we're grieving or stressed or uncertain are suddenly forbidden. 
But equally, I don't think there are many people who wake up every day, every single day crying, and I mean really crying, banging their heads against the wall, sobbing about what's going on. Yes, I obviously we have bad days. I mean, my feed on my Facebook page is really hard memories of last year, holidays that we went on, events that our children enjoyed. But other than the odd bad day, I'm willing to bet that most of us have set our mind to the task of getting through this. We had no plan for it. We weren't prepared. For most countries around the world, lockdown happened overnight, pretty much. Um, maybe we had a day or two to go and get our hair cut or store the supermarket for some toilet roll. But this wasn't a year-long setup where we could arrange for our loved ones to join us or plan a career change in the event that our job became obsolete. We barely had time to have a last meal in our favorite restaurant or the last swim in the sea or pool. So what did we do? I think what we've done comes very naturally to us. Herminia Ibarra is a professor of organizational behavior, unlike myself, and she's written several books, including one called Working Identity that talks about change. And she looks at it particularly in the context of work and in instances where people have made big transitions, for example, from literature professor to stockbroker or psychoanalyst to a monk or like myself, lawyer to author. And what she's found in her research is that nobody who's transitioned successfully has had a plan and that actually that's a good and positive thing. When someone decides to uproot their life, if they sit around and plan and plan and think about it, well, that's actually called procrastination. The best approach is a test and learn approach. Act first and then change your way of thinking. What you know only comes from doing. I can certainly vouch for that. That's exactly what happened to me. I didn't plan my career change. It came about from circumstance and trying things out. Um, by you know, being willing to experiment and being interested in what a new life might have to offer. Because as far as I was concerned, after 18 months, I was going back to being a lawyer. But actually being forced out of my old life gave me the freedom to try something different. And so we come back to what do you do? And when we look back on this time, what did we do? I think the key to any success is reaching for small wins. As you know, I write novels. A standard novel is around 90 to 100,000 words. If I thought about that amount of words every morning when I sit down at my computer, I wouldn't have the energy to even start. So I take it in sentences and paragraphs and pages, and eventually I get there. Small wins. That philosophy has also helped me through this period a day at a time. A bad day on a Monday, an okay day on Tuesday. I mean, no one's coming out of this with better hair, any thinner, better educated. I don't care what people are putting out there on Instagram. We're all just surviving. We're just getting through it. And yes, we are resilient. We will survive it. We are survivors and we will adapt to this new way of life. But I do wonder at what cost. Can we truly become inured to life where we don't connect? at least not physically, where we can't hug, where we can't see people's faces other than from behind a mask. We are resilient, we will adapt, and part of achieving that is looking for the benefit in these hard times, looking for those green shoots bravely pushing up through barren earth. So yes, the current period has been good for climate change. It's been good to stop for a while, to spend more time with our children, to stop racing around the globe, racing around the city, to appreciate nature, appreciate simple things. But it's also been a time of violence for some behind closed doors. For some it means the end of living here, of the security of a job. For a lot of people it means the end of a lot. So what will be the cost? I think the cost will be paid if we heft our shoulders to this task without acknowledging how difficult it truly is. This isn't a marriage or a birth or even a death in the normal circumstance of things. To quote the even now hackneyed phrase, these are unprecedented times. These are times to which we have yet to adapt fully. So our foundations are rocking, but there's no standard for us to look to, no template to how we should behave. In the UK, we keep 
you know, saying, oh, this comparing it to the Second World War. And I keep joking to my friends that I'm oh, okay, I'd quite like to go jitterbugging with a fit American soldier, um, not be sat locked in my house with my grumpy middle-aged lawyer husband. <laughs> but um, it's a cliche, but cliches are born from truth. This is an unprecedented time. There's no parent or grandparent we can ask and turn to and say, what should we do? So I think we're going to do what we need to do and what we have to do, which is let it out, acknowledge it. When we're born, we're not afraid, we cry, and we're not ashamed. We let it out. Creativity helps, writing helps, talking helps. We still eat, we still drink, probably a little bit too much at the moment. We remember, we can't hug, but we can connect like we are tonight. We connect in our hope, which it seems to me is also an integral part of being human, that things will pass, good times and bad. And we hope for something a little bit lighter, a little bit easier, just a way down the road, just around the corner. That's where our resilience and adaptability come from, I think. That we will survive, that we will get through. I think they come from hope. Thank you. Our chat. If you prefer to ask the question via chat, then please just um, ask it to either everyone, put it in the chat box, or you can send it privately to the Australian International School address. Just click the um, link down on the bottom. All right. So I suppose I'll, I'll ask the first question, Alice, if I may. I'm curious about this transition from from lawyer to to writer. Do you, do you find that you use different sides of your brain when you're when you're involved in those two tasks, or do you, or given the sort of material you're writing, are you able to fuse your experiences into your writing? Uh, not really, not really the latter because the type of law that I did, you know, I, I wasn't a criminal lawyer. So, um, you know, when I've written quite technically technical books about the criminal justice system, I've, I've had to research that like anyone else would. Um, so no, but I mean, I think that being a lawyer, you, it is quite a creative profession anyway, at least in litigation. I don't know, my husband will probably argue that he's very creative as well. But um, I think, you know, in this case, when you're writing arguments, um, obviously you're using the law as your main thing, but you are, you are creating stories that, you know, you build those arguments around and, um, and it's convincing somebody of the, the veracity of those stories. So, um, yeah, I think there, there was, there's always, there's, you know, using words, using language, so there are there are lots of similarities I think and um, and kind of trying to think think and sort of puzzle things out you know and trying to like maybe think outside the box a little bit so yeah I think there are some similarities can you can you share for us a little bit more about your your human rights law background and I, we know that you've had a couple of shall we say famous or infamous clients that you worked with? Would, well, have you been very, very clients. I mean, I'm, I might, you know, it's amazing the way you can paint things because I was actually on the other side, I, I was a government lawyer and um, I worked in immigration. So we were, you know, depending on your political views, I was either the goodie or the baddie, but I, you know, we were essentially <laughs> trying to keep people out. <laughs> um, so yeah, there was a Snoop Dogg was the, trying to come in to, to the UK to do a concert and um, you know, I was trying to keep him out because he <laughs> got the fracar at Heathrow Airport, and, and then there was. Did, um, he, did he get that? Did he get that far? He got to the airport. Well, no. What happened was he'd come, he'd arrived at the airport, and then he'd got into this fracar. Then the, he'd been given a caution by the police, and then he tried to come back in like a year later, and they said, you know, it's just it's just standard if you've been given a caution or you've had, you know, you're generally not allowed to come back in. So. He was arguing that because he was giving a big concert in Hyde Park. <laughs> so, um, but one of the cool things about that was that he submitted as evidence his performance in Starsky and Hutch. <laughs> I mean, he played Huggy Bear in Starsky and Hutch, and so we have to watch the film <laughs> as work. 
was, that was a good day. <laughs> so in actual fact, you were punished more than... Oh, well, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. We've got another question here. Um, your other, about your other, one of your other famous or infamous um, people that you were involved with in your life in law, which was, I'd really like to know what sort of person Winnie Mandela was like. Well, I never met her. I mean, so this is the thing, like, you know, it, it, um, I was basically dealing with, she, if you remember in the, the apartheid era, there was, she had a, uh, there was this notorious gang called the football gang, football team, which were her kind of boys that she'd taken from the ghetto. And then they got accused of doing lots of terrible crimes, you know, again, depending on who was arguing it that they were in defense of themselves and so again it was just like those boys trying to come into the uk to seek asylum and you know working out whether that was true or not so i'm sorry i didn't meet her this is the kind of thing that publicists put on books and then everyone gets really excited <laughs> and then actually it's just not that exciting <laughs> excellent all right we've got a, another question here obviously um i think it's always a good question to ask writers it's a bit like uh, asking a parent about their children. Do you, do you have a favourite book amongst those that you've written? Um, uh, yeah, it is a bit like children. Um, maybe The Flower Girls. Maybe it's, I've, I've, I've definitely found The Flower Girls the easiest book to write. That came very quickly, despite, as I described, all of the edits back and forth between my agent and I. Um, the actual bones of the story um you know i wrote in a few months really i mean it just it came very easily the characters came very easily and the, the, the main issue with the edits was more the sort of structure and how the different chapters kind of followed on from each other it, all the character stuff was all there um and and even though a lot of the characters in that book are not very nice um i felt like i really connected to them all like i i i was I knew who they were. I mean, not, I do that obviously with all my books, but that one in particular, I, I pretty much, I felt sorry for, for most of them. You know, I, I could <laughs> see, well, I could see that they, they were all flawed human beings, but they, you know, they, they could justify it to themselves, I think. Do, do you find that you always write um, from experience or are, are, are all, is there, in each character, is there an essence of, someone you know or someone you've met or someone you've read about or no not every character um uh i mean i often do steal things yeah sure i mean like you, you have to be fairly careful hanging out with writers because we will if you say something <laughs> particularly you know idiotic or <laughs> Or clever, or either you know, like you might find yourself being quoted um, a few years down the line. Um, I, yeah, I, you know, I think right, all writers are observers of people. That's what we are. We look at people. People watch. You just notice how people behave and kind of like try and analyze it and see why it is. And then when you write them, you write a character. You you are trying to understand why that character is doing what they're doing. Um, so yeah, I mean, you do you, you pull on your experience of, of the people that you've met in your life, you know. Um, that's, that's the well of experience you have. We we have a question from um, Catherine Marshall, who's one of our teachers, and I know one of your big fans. Um, she wants to know: Has writing short stories influenced your novel writing process? Ah, that's a good question. Um, hi, Catherine. Um, I think writing short stories is probably the hardest form of long form writing. I mean, sort of separate from poetry, which I think is the hardest form of writing, full stop. But um, short stories are incredibly hard um, for the obvious reason that you don't have very long. <laughs> um, and so I've, I've written a few short stories, but they, they've all been hard um i really enjoy writing them but i find that i can only write them when i'm kind of like it's they, you sort of get taken over by a character or an idea and then it, it kind of all comes out and then that's it i mean it's an incredible rush actually when that happens I mean, but you you never know when the next one's going to come so uh 
I mean, yeah, I couldn't write short stories as my only form of writing. I, I wouldn't write anything. <laughs> I was just sat here waiting for the, the idea, you know. Um, I, I think it's an incredibly skilled form of writing. I'm very admiring of people that do it well. Um, yeah, so it, it is, it, in terms of being a writer, it's a fantastic exercise. It's a good way of kind of getting better because it's hard. Right, okay, I'm going to write short stories. That sounds terribly difficult. Um, so we've got another great question here. How do you think 2020 will be remembered with the benefit of hindsight? Um, this is from Melissa. Do you think we will learn anything from it? I mean, in the main, I think it's just going to be remembered as being really rubbish. I mean, <laughs> I just, <laughs> I can't, you know, no one's going to go, oh, that was a great year, wasn't it? I mean, we just had a ball. I mean, I go on Facebook and I, there are some really annoying people that are just like, oh, I just love it. I love spending time with my family. It's just so nice to be with my family all the time. And I'm like, really? Because, <laughs> I, I mean, I love my family, but, you know, we are being pushed to our limits and having a husband working from home and you know it it, it, it is um i think we're going to learn a huge amount about ourselves from it i mean obviously as i've said i mean we are resilient and we do that we have managed to cope with it we've done it you know we're there in singapore we're still there we're still going through it and yet you know we're still alive we're still laughing we're still being creative I mean that's the thing we are being creative we're organizing all of these events we're managing to kind of circumvent this social interaction this ban on social interaction um I, I don't know I, I find it quite depressing when uh, you know you look in the news and you see that China's reopened and you know all the pollution levels have just gone back up to what they were and you hear I don't know maybe maybe it'll just be like a bad dream in a year's time and then it'll just be something that we all kind of forget but um, have have I, you had any as a creative? I mean, I said obviously the content that's around is. I said there's been some cases where I, you know in, in my area I've noticed that a lot of publications, you know, their content they've been really clever at pivoting and it's it's really quite been in, inspirational. For you, has the you know the events that we're currently undergoing has that sparked any ideas? Is it are you formulating any sort of novels? What what sort of have you got any thoughts at the moment, any impact or influence it might have on something that you will write? I don't know. I don't know about you, but I mean, I, I found, I mean, normally I read a hell of a lot. And the first sort of few weeks of lockdown, the first month of lockdown, really, I found I couldn't read a book. Um, I just couldn't concentrate. I couldn't get into anything. Um, and so this idea, there's this sort of latent guilt as well that, you know, we should be using this time to be, you know, creating these masterpieces and like coming out of lockdown going, ta-da, here's my, you know, opera. The, the, and I've learned. Yeah. yeah. And, and so there's this sort of shadow of guilt over everybody that perhaps, you know, we haven't done that. We've just been just getting through it. Um, I have started writing a new book, which I'd, I'd had the idea about before all of this and I'd kind of, been messing around with it and so I have managed to, to do a little bit of that I've been editing my new book that's coming out um, at the beginning of next year um, the weird thing I think is going to be whether people write stories about this time and I think that's going to be really hard at the moment it feels too soon you know like I've got the book that I got coming out next year was actually going to be set in 2020 we moved it because it was just like to cope with all of that I mean it just changed everything and then you think like how do you refer to it it's just because we don't know we don't know how it's going to end is it going to end and be something that's just finished or is this going to be something that we just now have to live with forever and ever and ever in which case it's going to have to be dealt with in in art um so I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I, I mean, the idea of writing about lockdown whilst living in lockdown sounds to me absolutely horrific, but maybe there's some brave soul willing to take that on. Interesting. So that probably segues quite nicely to a question from Paulina. Hi, Alice. I'm curious to know what book are you currently reading? Oh, actually, I'm reading uh, old school. I'm reading Red Dragon by Thomas Harris because I wanted to read, I went on Twitter and I asked people 
what was the scariest book that they ever read and that was one of the suggestions and obviously i'd seen silence of the lambs i haven't even read silence of the lambs but so i thought i'd start with red dragon so i'm reading that um i've just started it so i don't, can't tell you but it's always quite interesting as a thriller writer or as a crime writer to see how other people do it so i mean that's always my biggest piece of advice if i'm ever teaching writing is just to read all the time and to to look at how other people do things that you know that work well and essentially think, just try and steal them you know <laughs> do you do you recommend if you're a writer reading across genres or should you should you delve mainly in your own genre yeah definitely read anything everything i mean i say this to my kids like i don't mind if they read comics or you know any i mean i just think anything that you read that kind of takes you into a different world and you see how that world is created and if it's successful that's a great thing to experience so i do i mean i, I read all over the shop yeah dude actually that's probably nice for a lot of parents in the audience do you have any tips on how to get kids to read more probably don't tell them to read i think is a good one i think um it, you know it's like anything if i get told to do something i immediately don't want to do it so um <laughs> just being <laughs> Stubborn, difficult person that I am. I've known that before I told you to take your necklace off. Well, I know, I know. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I just, I, I buy my kids, but you know, for Christmas and birthdays and stuff and sort of just, um, my kids do read. Um, they see me reading. So they've kind of just grown up with it, you know, being there. Um, that's not to say that parents who don't read that their kids won't become voracious readers it's just i think just always i think no pressure just let them do you know they'll come to things they'll be there's always going to be that one book that just takes you in and that you go oh my god i can't put it down and it might not be until they're you know in their teens or whatever but don't stress is my advice excellent advice all right, so from Shannon, I would love to know how you have researched your books. Have people been willing to share their knowledge or how have you gone about getting them to share with you? Um, hi, Shannon. Um, yeah, people are very kind. I've, um, when I did the plea procedurals set in Durham, um, I made great friends with some brilliant um, Geordie coppers up in the northeast and they took me out and about and... Um, They've let me email them subsequently questions about police procedure, even in the flower girl stuff, you know, that to do with, you know, what happens when you arrest somebody, you know, like what can they actually do if they're sat in a cell? What can, you know, what would you be like with them? Um, and people in prisons, I've actually, I've, like, uh, so I've spoken to a lot of people in prisons. What am I? Oh, the, the book that I'm writing at the moment is um, there's a, there's a scene in it where there's a, an explosion underwater a, a dynamite fishing explosion and i've had long email i mean this is the advantage of lockdown so we've got a bit more time but um i had long chats with this uh, dive master all about that and about dynamite fishing and the effects of, of that so yeah people in general are, are really willing to tell you about their lives and their jobs you know because that's what they enjoy and what they know about and they're very happy to pass that knowledge on so it's um that's a great part of the job actually i really i really like it excellent um we've got an another question here too about war child you said i think maybe this could have a second coming well sorry just a question about can you just remind us again when it was published um and where we can or what was it, it was published. published oh no, no. okay no. Because everybody said it was, it just would never happen. <laughs> All the countries would shut their borders. It was just too, and it wasn't written as a kind of, you know, sort of sci-fi, like fantasy thing. It was written as, no, I think this really could happen. I think it was 2012, I finished it. David Cameron was um, the UK Prime Minister. And, they, and it was, like, it was just getting really horrible, the atmosphere about immigration and, um, there'd been a few sort of terrorism attacks and I just thought in my head they were talking about revoking the human rights act in the UK which obviously I worked a lot with when I was a lawyer there and that seems wrong as a personal view um, so I'd just written this story about um, a government lawyer I uh -huh, wonder where I got that inspiration from um, who was involved in creating this law where 
children would basically be drafted into a government army removed from their parents and like they would have to you know a bit like national service but they, but it was like full on and it was locked down in the country so you couldn't leave you couldn't say right i'm gonna go and live in australia no you couldn't and so the, the, the government lawyer's wife says you're not having my child thanks very much so she goes on the run and she ends up living in with this kind of like terrorist group up in the north of scotland and it's it's kind of it was all about that and um it was good actually and i loved writing it and it was like it was a bit of a gripping yarn and it ended up down at the mall buckingham palace you know big marches and flags and bombs going off and all that kind of stuff but I think now I can't do it because, I mean, everyone would just say I'd nicked the idea from life. I, I think that you've, you've got an audience right here for that book right now. I'd buy it for starters. And I'm surely, you just pitched it well to us. Can't you, can't you go and repitch it? Well, maybe, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. How, how did, when, when this all happened then, and given that you'd written that, whatever, eight years ago, how did how did what was your feeling at the time in terms of the fact that you'd already explored that idea yeah it was did, just like a big fat i told you so <laughs> 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 like, you know my, my book wasn't about a virus so it wasn't um it wasn't quite the same but i mean i do find it extraordinary that there are all these talks on shore people on online at the moment have seen them you know like them um, bill gates and people you know predicting that this was going to happen they've known that it was going to happen for years and years and why therefore it came such a shock to everybody so yeah it is it's an interesting uh, thing that we were so sort of ill i mean singapore was was more prepared than most but um yeah interesting that we kind of let that one go yeah, exactly uh, okay we've got another question here what is the first thing you're going to do after lockdown finishes? Or oh, sorry, the CB as we call it in, in Singapore. I am hugely excited that I'm going to get my hair done next week. Um, I still don't really understand why I'm allowed to go and get my hair done, but I can't have a game of tennis. That, that one passes me by, but nevertheless, I will take it. I am going to go and sort this mop out. And I am really missing playing tennis, so that would be something that I'd love to do. And then, you know, I just want to see my mates and just go and have like a Thai meal and drink a beer and have a chat that's not on a screen. Yes, that sounds very... I'm sure it all relates to that, yeah. It's very yeah. appealing, I'm sure, to everybody. Um, just a couple more questions, and if anyone else in the audience would like to, you know, unmute themselves and ask a question, please, please feel free as well. Um, what what advice would you give first time writers? What what would be the top three things that they should do in terms of the process of of getting pen to paper and book onto shelf? Well, I mean that's two separate things. I mean pen to paper is just put pen to paper. <laughs> I mean I know it sounds really facetious, but it, it's I mean as I've said, read read a lot, read a lot. You know you can teach yourself so much just through reading. Um, and then it is about having an element of discipline and just doing it. Um, you know, at, at some point you have to commit to it and it is just a case of getting the requisite amount of words. There's, you know, there's nothing more dispiriting than a blank page, you know, but once you've got words on it, you've got your 80 to 90,000 words, it might be rubbish, but I tell you what, there'll be bits of it in there that will be really good. And it's just a case of at least then you've got a hole, something that you can mess around with and play around with and, and cut up and move and change, write new stuff. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of an author called Barbara Kingsolver, who wrote a book called The Poisonwood Bible. It's quite an old book. Oh, now. Yes, yes. Probably about 20 years old, I think. Um, and that's, it's a book about four sisters that live in the Congo, I believe, with their, their priest father. Anyway, it was massively well received. Everybody loved it. And the, the book is told from four points of view of the four sisters. Yeah. Well, she wrote an entire book for each sister. And then she took the best bits from those books and put them into four. Like, I'm not suggesting that that is a good way to write a book. But what it, what it says to me is that there's a lot of stuff that you throw away that it does, it's not a waste of time you writing it, it just means that it is not relevant to, to how this story is being told. 
Um, and so really to write a book, you've just got to write a book. <laughs> and it's kind of annoying to hear that. <laughs> it's like there's, just, there's no shortcut to it. And yeah, that's not good news. Um, do, do, you, do you have a, do you have a, a process that you use? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, when people start writing and want to write a book, we're not sponsored by anybody. You know, most of us have other things in our lives, whether it be a full-time job, part-time job, children, households to run, whatever it is. Um, so it's just about time and it's about finding time. And so I write, I mean, obviously things are different at the moment, but I write when my children are at school. I, you know, I take them to school and I come home and I write and I'll write as long as I can do it for before I get fed up and then they come home and then maybe when they when they're you know after they've done home or we've had dinner or whatever I might go and look at what I've written that day and edit it and mess around with it for a bit but Monday to Friday that's what I do I don't write on weekends but Monday to Friday that's what I do yeah and, and do you have a word do you have a word count that you try and hit every day I mean, I try and write a thousand words a day. Sometimes I can write more. Sometimes I, I don't write anything. That, I mean, that's rare. I will generally, because I, I give myself.